Radio. It's time for Grounded in the Word with your teacher, Jacob Prash. Jacob teaches the whole counsel of God using the same Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament as Jesus and his apostles did 2,000 years ago. You will want to grab a pen and paper and take notes as you get grounded in God's Word. Your best defense against falling for error in these perilous times. We've begun talking about the Church of Philadelphia tonight. Now with this in view, let's look at Revelation chapter 3 verse 7. And to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia writes, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from an hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to that which you have in order that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it any more, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven, from the heaven of my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you're with us for the first time, and I know a few people are, we're looking at these seven churches from the following perspective. There are seven churches which literally existed at the end of the first century in the area now we call Turkey, Roman province of Asia Minor. Secondly, there are seven types or examples of churches which could exist at any time in history. And thirdly, they are types of different ages of the church. We have to remember that anything that we use to apply to a different age of the church has to be in the character with the churches that existed in the first century. If we were to say that only Ephesus was for the first century, all these churches would have to be churches of Ephesus, if you follow the rationale. The last time we looked at the church, which was in Sardis, and we began looking at how the Protestant Reformation matched the description that the Lord gave to Sardis. In Jeremiah 31:31. 31, 31, the Lord said he'd make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The new covenant would not be made with the Gentile church, but would be made with the Jews. Romans 11 tells us that Gentile Christians are grafted in. One of the first problems of the reformers were they were replacementists. They saw the church as having the new covenant made with them and God having no place or purpose for Israel or the Jews in his final plans for salvation. Initially, the reformers were of that mindset. Now, different people who followed the reformers didn't think that way. Some of them thought quite differently. Nonetheless, much of what you see in churches today, the idea of replacementism, is because they're going back to what the reformers said, not to what the Word of God said. They are looking at the Bible through the prism of the Reformation. Another problem with the reformers, and a more significant one, was this. What the reformers did was said they were going back to biblical Christianity. And in fact, they did in some sense make a major step back towards it in that they reaffirmed the authority of Scripture against tradition and they emphasized justification by faith, the gospel, salvation being by faith, not by works or by sacraments. But to really restore biblical Christianity, the first and foremost thing you had to do was to break the unscriptural marriage between church and state that Constantine brought about. The new covenant would not be like the one I made with their fathers. Jeremiah was predicting the new covenant would undo this situation where Jews thought they had an automatic relationship with God simply because they were part of the state church. That's what the new covenant was to do. Constantine 
puts it back. The thing that Jesus buys to get rid of, Constantine puts it back. Now, the normal criteria for being a member of the church in the early church was being born again, believer's baptism. But after Augustine makes a state church again, and Constantine, they begin doing the same thing the Jews did. Instead of baptizing, instead of circumcising babies on the eighth day, they begin baptizing babies. Let the unsaved come into the church. Luther did it. Calvin did it. Zwingli did it. The Church of England did it. All of them did it. And so it became. Instead of a church of the elect, which is what the Greek word church means, ecclesia, those who were called out, it became this mixture of the, those who were born again and those who weren't. So now you have a Protestant church that's filled with nominalism from the onset. In Britain, you had a problem. Queen Mary comes and tries to put Roman Catholicism back on England. Now, because most of the Roman Catholic clergy, I'm sorry, most of the Anglican clergy, were not Christians anyway, they had no problem changing with the political tide. The only reason they became Anglican is because Henry VIII was in power and so proclaimed it. Very few of them were truly converted in any sense. Henry VIII was an avowed enemy of the gospel. The Pope gave him the title, quote-unquote, the defender of the faith. The entire reason for his beginning the Church of England was his desire to take another wife, apart from the one he already had, to establish an heir to the throne, etc. He was a man who killed over 70,000 of his own people. Now, there was a lot of corruption going on in the monasteries, which he seized and closed down and seized for the state treasury and so on. Nonetheless, he himself was by no measure a Christian. Thomas More, who was executed by Henry VIII, was not executed because he wouldn't agree to Henry's divorce. The only problem Thomas More had was the Pope didn't approve it. If it was politically expedient, the Pope would have approved it. These kinds of, these kinds of uh, exceptions for people in positions of power were, were quite common. The Pope would give dispensations when it was politically and or financially expedient. But the Pope simply wouldn't approve it. So Queen Mary comes and tries to put Catholicism back. And because most of the Anglican clergy were not Christians, most of them had no problem going back. But something happened by this time. Although Tyndale had been executed, again, by Cardinal Wolsey and Henry VIII, he was actually arrested and burned in Belgium. And you can go to many places in England, including right in front of St. Paul's Cathedral, they burned Bible-believing Christians. The Church of England killed them, as well as the, the Roman Catholic Church. And Spiderfield's Market's another place. Norwich is another place. Despite all that, Queen Mary comes into power and tries to re England. Now, there were some true believers in the Anglican clergy who were really saved. Most of them, probably less than 300, 292 in all, I believe, were, were, were killed by Queen Mary. The most famous ones being, of course, Cranmer, Ridley, Latimer, Hooper. Hooper was killed in London. The others were burned in Oxford where the monument is today in Oxford. Actually, Cranmer recanted his faith, and only when they were going to burn him anyway did he recant his, his recantation. So I'll leave it to the Lord to decide about Cranmer. But certainly Ridley, Latimer, and Hooper were Bible-believing Christians who paid the ultimate price, and they wouldn't go in to the C of E, to the re Church of England. A lot of other people fled to Europe. And in Europe, they came under the influences of Calvinism. So after Queen Mary, they returned to Britain with a very strong Calvinistic influence. Much of Britain is still Roman Catholic, and they try not only to reestablish the Church of England as it was, but they said the Church of England was not radical enough. We have to go back further to the Bible, as they saw it, along Calvinistic lines. A compromise was made, and this is the beginning of what you find in the Church of England today. You had three factions back then. The liberals at that time were called latitudinarians. They weren't like the modern liberals, with using higher criticism and German rationalism. They were, but they were still liberals, theologically. They were called latitudinarians. Then there were, of course, the high church, which were Catholic, 
And then there were the evangelicals who were predominantly people who became known as Puritans, wanting the pure religion. And how do you keep this house of cards together when you have evangelicals, Catholics, and liberals together? The first attempt to hold this house of cards together was called the Elizabethan Settlement. When the Elizabethan Settlement broke down, the Puritans were forced out, and this all became bound up with Cromwell and the English Civil War. You'll find born-again believers in the Church of England today who will say things like, praise God for what he's doing in the Church of England. They think they're on the ascent and they're going to take it over. The first time they almost took over, what happened was, the Catholics got more Catholic under Queen Mary, and that was it. The others were either martyred or forced to Europe. But then, they really became on the ascent under the Puritans. And what happened then was, the liberals, the latitudinarians, got more liberal, and the Catholics got more Catholic. They made the Elizabethan settlement to try to hold these three different factions of the liberals, the Catholics, and the evangelicals together. But the whole thing broke down, and out came the Puritans. The evangelicals came out. That was in the 17th century. In the 18th century, as we're going to see in Philadelphia, it happens once again. Now it's the Methodists. George Whitfield, John Wesley, Charles Wesley. The Methodist revivals. It begins as a charismatic movement within the Church of England. It happens, but what happens? You had people called the anti-enthusiasts. They were like the liberals. And then you had the Catholics getting more Catholic, asserting their episcopacy. And what happens in the 17th century? The same thing that happened in the 16th century. What happened in the 18th century? The same thing that happened in the 17th century. The liberals get more liberal, the Catholics get more Catholic, and out come the Methodists. The 19th century, the same thing. Tremendous evangelical revival within the Church of England. William Wilberforce, the Earl of Shaftesbury, tremendous evangelical awakening. Praise God for what he's doing in the Church of England. But what happens in the Church of England? Precisely this. The liberals got more liberal. By that time, German rationalism began and higher criticism. All these ideas from Germany, from Tübingen and the rest of it, begin coming in to English theology and Oxford and Cambridge. So the liberals begin getting more liberal, and then the Catholics get more Catholic. What's called the Oxford Movement, the, Trinita the uh, Tractarian Movement. John Henry Newman. Many people think a Jesuit agent even when he was Anglican, but in the end he became a full-fledged Roman Catholic. The liberals got more liberal, the Catholics got more Catholic, out came the Plymouth Brethren. Calvinism becomes fairly widespread throughout a lot of areas of Europe. In France, they became the Huguenots. The Huguenots faced terrible persecution at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church. The St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where they were promised peace if they would simply come to some kind of openness about their faith, and they did and they faced a genocidal slaughter. They're openly lied to, and then systematically exterminated, Gestapo-style. That was the Huguenots in France. The same thing they did to John of Huss and the Bohemian Brethren. They promised them security and freedom of religion, that they would come out from hiding and so on, and when they did that, the Pope simply had them exterminated, genocidally. In Northern Europe, and through German-speaking Europe, it was the Lutherans. Luther's ideas took root and you had a Lutheran state church. But again, most of it was nominal. Within a hundred years of the Reformation, most Protestants were not born again. Most Protestants were not born again. It was a natural stepping stone from evangelical Protestantism to liberal Protestantism. It was a natural stepping stone. For two, at least two reasons. One reason was this. Because you had so much to do with phony miracles and things like this, like we see today in the Roman Catholic Church, I just heard on the radio now they're claiming some statues are moving around somewhere in, in Wicklow in Ireland. Uh, this kind of hocus-pocus stuff. And the sale of, uh, of uh, relics and this kind of stuff. The reformers didn't like miracles, and they couldn't point to any miracles. It was one of the main Roman Catholic arguments against the Reformation was, if you're really of God, where were your miracles? And there weren't any. So, be that as it may, the Reformers took a very 
rationalistic view, particularly John Calvin. The reason the gospel was able to spread so quickly in the first and second century was because of Pax Romana. The Romans had a system of roads. They had good trade routes they copied from the Phoenicians. They brought a relative political stability to the world, relative economic stability to the world, and so on. The Jews are in the diaspora. You have the Bible and Greek, the Septuagint. Everything was set up for the gospel to spread quickly in the first century. So, too, everything was set up for the Reformation to happen when it did. People's worldview changed. Now, that's important, and we're going to come to why it's important at the end. So, you've got this nominal Christianity now. And a lot of bad things begin to happen. The Seven Years' War, Protestants fighting Catholics all over Europe. By pure happenstance, two foreign kings, one called William of Orange and the other called James, who was a Catholic, who, a Protestant who became a Catholic, had a war in Ireland. The war had nothing directly to do with Ireland. It was a continental war. Nonetheless, that's where it happened. Two foreign kings had a war. That's going, the ramifications of that are going on to this day, in part, in Northern Ireland. It just came back. It's still going on. They speak about the Battle of the Boyne as if it were a recent event. The Puritans were like Calvin. They were replacementists. And they believed in Reformed theology. The church is the new Israel. So therefore, when the Puritans were fighting their battles, they said, well, how did Israel make war? Let's see. Joshua killed every man, woman, and child. So that's what we're going to do. In the English Civil War, you had Cromwell's new model army and against the loyalists, the cavaliers, and so on. And rightly, Calvin was afraid of the Roman Catholic Church. What the Roman Catholic Church has done even to this present century is this, is tell people their first loyalty is to Holy Mother of the Church, and it's their obligation to practice subterfuge and undermine non-Catholic governments. To this very century, they've engaged in that practice. Cromwell's fears of the papacy were justified. But he actually began using and engaging in open genocide. Now, I don't discredit or delete from the positive things to be said about the early Puritans. Joseph Aileen, Richard Baxter, even John Owen. These people are well worth reading in many respects. Nonetheless, you had this police state that Calvin created in Geneva, copied or duplicated in Scotland, and then the Puritans duplicated it in England, and they openly engaged in war crimes. We like to associate the Puritans with the establishment of parliamentary democracy, and that's true. But the real Democrats, the real libertarians, as we would think of libertarians today, the Puritans killed them. Now again, it was a natural stepping stone for conservative Protestantism to become nominal. A natural stepping stone. To begin with, you've got the majority of Protestants who are not converted. Secondly, their hermeneutics, the way they interpreted the Bible, again comes from 16th century humanism, which Calvin and Zwingli and so on copied from Erasmus, studying the Bible as history and literature. So while the reformers said, we're going to study the Bible as history and literature, believing it's the God of the, the Word of God, in time, when rationalism, German rationalism comes into play, people who are influenced by Immanuel Kant and, and so on, and, and Feuerbach and the early founders of, of liberal theology and, 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 and higher criticism, people became saying, well, we're going to study the Bible as literature and history also, only we don't believe it's the Word of God, it's just literature and history. One was the natural progression to the other. The other idea was, Calvin, they all downplayed miracles, so they didn't believe they existed anymore. They were cessationists. These things ceased with the apostles. They were influenced by Chalcedon. So therefore, since they're rationalists already, even though they were rationalists who believed in God, pretty soon you have rationalists who say it's irrational to believe in God. Liberal Protestantism was the natural progression from the reformers. Calvinism was anti-supernaturalist rationalism, and it is to this day. Again, the problem is, instead of going back to the Word of God, they went back to what the patristics, the church fathers, particularly Augustine, said about the Word of God, 
that became more important than Scripture itself, even though they wouldn't admit it. They looked at it to what Augustine said. Now, you've got this whole mess now, and Protestantism is largely nominal. But the Calvinistic influence gets into the social fabric of the societies where it prospers. Holland, but especially in Great Britain. And this Calvinistic mentality becomes part of the social fiber. You can see this anywhere where you have a strong Calvinistic society, where the influences of Calvinism go from the church and permeate the social fabric, people's thinking. You have a conspicuous history of oppression and social injustice. The American South segregated churches even in my lifetime. Even to this day, some are segregated. The Southern Baptists split from the American Baptists over the issue of slavery. We're predestined. God made us this way. That mentality gets into the social fabric, and what do you have? The Ku Klux Klan, very Calvinistic mentality in the American South. Northern Ireland, God predestined us. We're the elect. Those people are Catholics. What do you have? an oppressive society. South Africa, the Dutch Reformed Church, very Calvinistic church, very Calvinistic social mentality. We're predestined. We're the elect. God made us that way. You are not chosen. We have God's benefit. Wherever you have a proliferation of Calvinism, particularly hyper-Calvinism, I don't know any place that hasn't resulted in police states and oppression. I don't know any place that hasn't happened. I wish I could find one, but I basically cannot. I'm speaking now of extreme Calvinism. Now, someone in Holland, name was Jacob Arminius. Jacob Arminius. Arminius tried to react against extreme Calvinism. It's where we get the term Arminianism. He realized that God, if you were to believe what Calvinism seemed to be saying, it would make God the author of sin. It would make God the author of death. It would make God a God who sentenced people to hell even from before they were born. And he reacted. The argument is not between Calvin and Arminius. Calvin thought the argument began with someone called Pelagius, who we mentioned earlier. Pelagius denied original sin. And Augustine reacted against him. So Calvin took his ideas from Augustine and saying man has fallen, and that's it, and he can't save himself. By the time the Enlightenment began to happen, and the Reformation began to happen, people began having a black and white view of the world. They couldn't hold things in tension. It had to be either or. There are verses that say, those whom he foreknew, those whom he predestined, even from before the foundation of the world. But then there are other verses that say he's wanting that none should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The ancient Jewish mind could hold the two in tension. The Enlightenment mind and the worldview of Calvin when rationalism was beginning couldn't hold the two in tension. But now, that's changing again. All these things, changes in worldview, always come about because of a change in science and technology in some way. Calvin was a product of his time and his thinking. We have to realize he tried to redefine Christianity the best he could for his time in response to a particular situation. But his time is not our time. We can hold the two intention with modern scientific worldview again. We no longer live in a black and white world. We, science has thrown all this old enlightenment science out the window. Now, other things began happening at this time. Although the Anabaptists, the ones at Munster, went into kingdom now theology and Montanism and began predicting things that didn't happen the way the Kansas City people and so on have done today, they weren't all crazy. And someone called Menno Simons came along, a converted Roman Catholic. I believe he was a Roman Catholic clergyman, I'm not sure. And he represented the best of that movement. And the Mennonites had a tremendous influence. They kept the Bible separate from politics, wouldn't get caught up in this, and evangelized much of Europe at a turbulent time, terribly persecuted, 
disliked by both Catholics and Protestants, and was shown grace even as far as Russia by Catherine the Great, who welcomed them into Russia. Even to this day, you find old Mennonites, they'll frequently name at least one of their daughters Catherine, after Catherine the Great. But the problems happen now with the repercussions of Calvinism. You see today, people with strict Protestant views are still caught up in the 16th century mindset. But they don't realize it's obsolete. Reacting against Arminius, who tried to take a more balanced position, Calvin's followers began coming up with something called the Remonstrance of Dort, held in Holland. At this place, Dort, they came up with something in English we call the tulip. Total depravity, man is totally fallen. Every aspect of his being is fallen. That's the T. You is undeserved grace. We didn't do anything to earn our salvation or to deserve it. God did it for us in his mercy. But then comes the L, limited atonement, or as some people call it, particular redemption. Jesus didn't die for the sins of the world. He didn't die for everybody. He only died for the elect, those who were predestined to go to heaven. Then there's irresistible grace. If you're elect, you have no choice. You're going to be saved and go to heaven. The grace is irresistible. And then P, the, the P in the tulip, perseverance. You can't backslide and fall away. If you backslide and fall away, you were never saved to begin with. They emphasize this against Arminius. Now, what do you do? You have nominal Protestantism, politicized Protestantism. The Roman Catholic Church initially tries to stop Protestantism with something called the Counter-Reformation. Some of the popes were themselves humanist scholars. Remember, the humanists influenced the reformers. And they tried all kinds of ways. There were some mystics who, who gave a charismatic emphasis to the Catholic Church, and they tried through mysticism to reform it from within. You had other people like Vincent de Paul, who tried to do, after the Reformation, what Francis of Assisi did before it, tried to reform it from within through kindness and this. But mostly, they used the sword. Initially, it was the Dominicans. Before the Reformation, the chief murderers of the papacy were the Dominicans. They were the ones with the indulgence merchants who tortured the people with the Inquisitions. But afterwards, they came up with people called the Jesuits, founded by Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola used exercises copied in part from Eastern shamanistic influence which was a form of brainwashing, using these visualization techniques. And going through these exercises under the guide of a spiritual guru sort, another priest in the order, you would reach a point where you would say, if it is daylight out, and the Pope tells us it's night, we must believe it is night. Now, I was absolutely shocked when I read a book by Joyce Huguet saying that we should use the exercises of Ignatius Loyola as a guide for Christian prayer. And she has a lot of things, including breathing techniques, which come from yoga, and a lot of other things. But all of these things, these visualization techniques, you see with the name it and claim it people and so on, all of these things are rooted in shamanism and in African traditional religion. They're paganistic influences coming into evangelical churches, the same as they came into Roman Catholic churches. But they're totally unscriptural and very dangerous. The Jesuits became the agents, not only of, as missionaries, spreading Roman Catholicism to the newly discovered world, but they became agents of political subversion, trying to overthrow governments with their influence to bring them under the papacy. And no matter what anyone tells you, they're still in the same business. They are still very much in the same business. So you've got this thing now. Protestantism and Catholicism, neither one of them are any longer the faith of the Bible, by and large. But you had a few names in Sardis who remembered what they heard. One of these people was someone called Spenner. And Spenner said, we have to try to change the Lutheran church from within. Others disagreed with him and said it's become part of Babylon itself. So, the same as 
Luther and Calvin and Zwingli began as Roman Catholic clergy trying to change the Roman Catholic Church from within before the Reformation. Now you had people trying to change Protestantism from within after the Reformation. The main movement in continental Europe was known as the Pietists. A major figure in the Pietists was called Zizendorf. But here in Britain, the movement to change Protestantism from within were called the Methodists. John Wesley was a man who was son of a preacher from Epworth up in the lower Midlands, uh, I'm sorry, the upper Midlands, Doncaster. And uh, he'd been a missionary to the American Indians in Georgia. And he was on his way, but there was a storm at sea. And on the same ship, there were some Moravian missionaries. Now, during this very dark period of Christian history, there was a very noble sect of people that for over 100 years had a non-stop prayer chain, very mission-minded, called the Moravians. It was the Moravians who Wesley first encountered. And he said, I'm on my way to convert the heathen, but who's going to convert me? He knew Anglicanism, the Church of England, as it had become, couldn't satisfy the spiritual hunger in his soul. But he and his brother Charles were converted in the city of London, near Aldersgate. And he gives his testimony how his heart was strangely warmed. And that's the beginning. Through Moravian missionaries, the Wesleys come to faith. Wesley realizes what had happened. He realizes the simple truth of being born again. He realizes what had happened to Protestantism. And he begins by trying to change the Church of England from within. He doesn't get received too well initially. He goes all over this country on horseback. And vicars all over England begin organizing riots and mobs against him. Now his whole life was in preparation for this. The searching of the soul as a kid, his house went on fire, and he called himself like a brand plucked from the fire. His whole life was a preparation for what he faced. It was the church organizing riots against him. He married, quite probably out of the will of the Lord, to a woman that was the whole situation his brother got him involved with and all this. And his woman was not a believer, or if she was, she was a backslidden believer, and she used to follow him all over. He's no good, don't listen to him. <laughs> As if he didn't have enough problems. <laughs> Until the Lord took her. Well, somebody did. <laughs> When he went to Epworth, the church where he grew up, and his mother Susanna had over 20 children, had 20 children. They wouldn't let him in the church where he grew up and his father had been the vicar. So he went out in the graveyard and stood on his father's grave and preached the gospel. He said, I have a right on consecrated ground where my father's buried. I have a right to stand in his grave and preach the gospel. And that's what he did. Tremendous opposition and persecution. At the same time, another chap comes along who despite the fact that he was rather Calvinistic, he was a man of God. His name was George Whitfield. And these people begin going all over Britain. It was the end of the agricultural society and the beginning of industrialism. That's what happened. And it was against this background that Wesley's revivals began. But what his revivals were, were this. Educated, middle-class people who had a heart for the poor. One of the reasons revival has not come to Britain, one of the reasons, is because practically every evangelical church in Britain, apart from ones in the inner city where you have a lot of African immigrants and things like this, and Asian immigrants, almost all of British Christianity is a middle class institution. The gospel has always spread most rapidly among the poor. It is when the affluent, the educated, the middle class have a heart for the poor that things begin to happen. Jesus was, by his standards of his day, not what was called Am Ha'aretz. He was not working class. He was lower middle class. He was a carpenter with a trade. Even Peter, the fisherman, was lower middle class. Am Ha'aretz were people who owned nothing and used to work for other people in their fields very long days. That was what the majority of the population were. Trades people were a step above that, lower middle class. Matthew, 
was middle class. Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas was from, was from the aristocracy. Paul was from the religious, theocratic elite. Right from the beginning, God's economy has always been the haves taking care of the have-nots. The rich taking care of the poor, the educated taking care of the uneducated, the clever taking care of the simple, the strong taking care of the weak. That's always been his economy. The charismatic movement, most churches in Britain, they're middle class institutions. As long as the church remains with this middle class mindset instead of a servant mindset, and middle class Christians begin going into the inner cities, until that happens, we're never going to see any revival. Now, I'm not saying that's the only, I'm not saying that's the sole and solitary key to revival. Revival is a sovereign act of God's grace a sovereign outpouring of his spirit, but there are principles. And one principle in revival has always been the haves going to the have-nots. It begins with people praying for it, and when God's spirit is outpoured, there's that attitude of servantship. And it happens. And Wesley begins having a dynamic impact. To the point that the Church of England is shaken to its foundations. The Church is the somber, dead, Calvinistic corpse being kept alive by some kind of artificial life support because people are expected to go to church. You, your employer made you go and things like that. That's why it happened. Wesley's revivals were an Arminian reaction against Calvinism. They were an Arminian reaction against Calvinism and the social injustice it bred. When the revivals didn't take place in Ireland, he went to Ireland and he saw why it wasn't happening the way it was in England. And he said, if this is the way Protestants treat Catholics, it's no wonder they want to stay under the Pope. He doesn't treat them as bad as the Calvinists do. That was Wesley's conclusion. As a result of his revivals, slavery was abolished in the British Empire. Child labor was abolished in the British Empire. Prison reform took place in the British Empire. Literacy, schools for the working classes, took place in the British Empire. The mission movement began. Building societies, housing, where ordinary working people could own their own, own their own homes. Things like the Guardian newspaper, the Labour Party, all these things were born out of the influences of Methodism. But Wesley knew that repentance had to come first. He saw social injustice as a sin, but the real reason he hated it was not just because it was unjust and a sin, he said it causes other sin. He saw the crime and the decadence and the immorality as something that was bred by poverty. And he said to get rid of the sin, we've got to attack things that help engender it, which is a sin itself, this injustice. Now, it begins this way, but once you take Jesus out of these things, what happens? They go the way of the world. That's what happens to the labor movement. That's what happens to building societies. That's what happens to anything. All these things begin right, but when you take Jesus out of it, what happens? It turns to a source of oppression in itself. It goes back into the mentality of the world. Now, this is very, very important. The same as in Wesley's day, Britain was at the end of an agricultural society and at the beginning of an industrial society, Today, Britain is at the end of an industrial society and the beginning of a high-tech service informational economy. The change is just as radical. That was the world that Wesley came to and brought revival. That's the kind of world we're in now. The question is, is there going to be a revival? Some people will say the reason Britain didn't go into a revolution the way France did was because of Wesley's revivals. Other people would say Britain already had its revolution with the Civil War. That's what happened. In the United States, George Whitfield came. He said the Calvinists, the Puritans, failed in their mandate, and so the Lord sent him to evangelize America. Jonathan Edwards, the same, in the United States, colonial America. The Methodists do really well. But eventually, 
the high church won't have any more of it, and a split happens over ecclesiastical polity, <laughs> church government, and the Methodists come out. But Wesley was somebody, for all of his good points, realized toward the end of his day he made some kind of a mistake. He tried to put new wine in old wineskins. And he realized, by trying to change something from within and not taking a radical of enough stand in the beginning, he saddled himself with things he couldn't change. And one of the things he began bemoaning at the end of his days was this. The decline of scripture reading. The decline of the emphasis on teaching the word of God. He said, if this is what happens to Methodism when I'm alive, what's going to happen after I'm dead? And we saw what happened to it. Exactly what he knew would happen. It died. I went to Wesley's chapel once over on City Road several years back. Nobody in there was a Christian. I saw a church in, in uh, Acton Town in London. It said Wesleyan and Reformed Church. Well, Reformed is Calvinist, and Wesleyan, Wesley was an Arminian. How could a church be Wesleyan and Reformed? Very simple. The Wesleyans no longer believe what Wesley did, and the Reformed ones no longer believe what Calvin did. No problem. It's an interesting place to visit, but if you're ever on City Road, go to Bun Hill Fields. You'll see in Bun Hill Fields the cemetery where John Bunyan is buried, where Daniel Defoe, who wrote uh, Robinson Crusoe, John Wesley is buried in the back of the house, his mother Shoshana, George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, Sir Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, they're all buried in this non conformist cemetery because the C of E wouldn't allow them to be buried in consecrated ground. Now again, this period was preceded by different attempts to get it right. Even in Cromwell's day, and shortly thereafter, you had John Bunyan up in Bedfordshire. There was a charismatic movement that preceded the Methodists called the Quakers. The Quakers began as an evangelical movement, but the devil got to them the way he always gets to charismatic movements, through experiential theology. They'd meet in a room and wait for the inner light, the prompting of the Spirit. No leadership, no agenda, no structured worship as such. Just wait for the inner light. And they'd wait for prophetic revelation and words from the inner light, what God wanted to say to them, and that was their meetings. So eventually the inner light began telling them all kinds of crazy things, like they shouldn't have the Lord's Supper and all this kind of stuff. And they began getting into wrong doctrines. So the Quakers, although they began right, like most charismatic movements do, quickly went right off the rails because they were not well grounded in Scripture. The Methodists came, and initially it was simply biblically oriented, preaching oriented. But Wesley was shocked when people began experiencing the phenomena of being slain in the spirit at his meetings. Now Whitfield gets astounded when he sees this happening at Wesley's meetings. But then a few days later, he's even more astounded when it begins happening at his meetings. Guy to travel in cold, damp English weather a quarter of a million miles a year on horseback, he must have been some traveler. Clinics for the poor, everything. His brother, of course, Charles, was a hymn writer. They gave almost all their money away to the poor, almost all of it. Kept very little. It was a mighty time. Then, God begins working even in the established church. You have similar movements of people imitating Wesley, even in the, the Church of England. Rich aristocrats caring for the poor. William Wilberforce, the Earl of Shaftesbury. People like Florence Nightingale, the Christian. And the gospel influence begins permeating all of society. The music, the arts. Handel, George Handel. Uh, Felix Mendelssohn, a Jewish Christian, the composer. So Arthur Sullivan from Gilbert Sullivan who wrote the Penny Operas, Mikado and Iolanthe and all this. He wrote on with Christian Soldier after he was saved. The whole Christian influence begins going all over Britain and from Britain to other areas of the British Empire. Righteousness exalts a nation. This is when God blessed and used Britain. But it was always an Arminian reaction or at least a moderate Calvinistic reaction against the strong Calvinists. With the Baptist, it was George Carey. What they basically told him at the Baptist convention, as the story goes, 
Brother Carrie, sit down and be quiet. If God decides to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your help or mine. He was a shoemaker who learned multiple languages and translated the Bible and all this. Founder of the Baptist Mission Society. Britain evangelized nation after nation after nation. We all know about the bad side of colonialism and the exploitation. But there's two sides to the coin. There is another side of the coin. While the Church of England was popularly engaged in turning people into Christians in order to turn them into subjects of the Queen, there were other mission societies in this country who were only out to turn them into followers of Jesus. For whatever mistakes they made, God blessed this country and blessed this empire for 200 years as a result of these revivals. But then again, something happens in the Church of England. What happens? The Catholics get Catholic and the liberals get liberal. Out comes the Plymouth Brethren. What does Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love. That was their characteristic, the Plymouth Brethren. Hudson Taylor to China. Way ahead of his time. He knew that we shouldn't turn Chinese people or African people or Asian people into Englishmen. He wanted to bring them the gospel in their own culture, so he went to China and lived like a Chinaman. Just like a Chinaman, ate with chopsticks, married a Chinese wife, etc. Dr. Bernardo, in the east end of London, found a little kid asking for help, couldn't help the kid. He found the kid next day frozen to death in Whitechapel or Bethnal Green. Dr. Bernardo. For the first time, Bernardo's has abrogated its evangelical statement of faith. Now it's just a social organization that's no longer Christian that it claims to be following Dr. Bernardo, who is 1,000% Bible-believing Christian. George Mueller in Bristol, the same thing with the street children. The main hallmark of this church of Philadelphia was its name, Brotherly Love. Brotherly Love. They were, their sense of mission was always to bring the gospel, but always to help people practically the way Jesus did. Now, we have two kinds of mistakes. We have organizations like Christian Aid. Furthermore, like organizations like World Vision. They began as genuinely Christian. But soon they begin meeting people's human needs without giving them the gospel of salvation. That's not what Wesley did. And that's not what Jesus did. He met their human needs, but he met their spiritual needs, even their greater needs. These organizations have a way of beginning right, but getting away from their own heritage. So what happens? God gets somebody else. Terrible slums of East London, Mile End Wastes, Whitechapel, Bethnal Green, that area. And along comes Colonel Booth, beginner of the Salvation Army, onward Christian soldier. The same thing, the power of the gospel, not only to change lives, but to change society. That was the Church of Philadelphia. One movement after another. Now, of all these churches, there were only three that Jesus had no really strong criticism. Only two, actually, that he had no really no criticism. One was Smyrna that was anointed for burial. It was persecuted. But the other was Philadelphia. That was the greatest age the church had since the apostles. Of all these seven churches, it was also the church that was the most Jewish in its description. Look at the description of Philadelphia. The key of David, synagogue, synagogue in Greek, pillar and the temple, the new Jerusalem. Its imagery and its language that Jesus uses in addressing it is the most Jewish, the most Hebraic than any other church because it was the least Hellenistic. It was the least Hellenistic. The Plymouth Brethren their methods of interpreting the Bible were probably the closest the Gentile church has ever been to doing it correctly. The typology of the temple, looking at how the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament, and how the Old is in the New revealed. Novum Testamentum and Vedere Latet, the New is in the Old concealed, the Old is in the New revealed. Having little power, the way the early Christians did, nonetheless, through faithfulness, the power to triumph. They'll know we are Christians by their love. The same as the early Christians were able to win people with their love. So were the Philadelphians. That was this church. And it happened at a time of history 
very, very much like the time of history we're living in now. Now, one thing you'll find, people will come along claiming to be the founders of the followers of the founders of American British evangelicism. They will claim a heritage link somehow, a doctrinal link, with John Wesley or George Whitfield. But John Wesley and George Whitfield believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They'll claim a link in America with D.L. Moody or with R.A. Torrey or with Jonathan Edwards or Charles Finney. But those people all believed in the gifts of the Spirit. I was going to go to Moody Bible Destitute Institute until I read their prospectus. He said, you're not allowed to have a beard if you want to go to Moody Bible Institute. And on the front page were pictures of D.O. Moody and R.A. Torrey, big, big beards, they couldn't go to their own school. <laughs> you had a problem with a person called Charles Finney. Charles Finney was someone who had a mighty anointing on his life, believed in holiness and in power, but he was in very, very serious doctrinal error a borderline Pelagian. He was almost a heretic. He basically denied original sin. He said, man has not fallen. And we can get salvation through choosing Christ instead of Christ choosing us. Nonetheless, God used him. But there was a reaction, not only against Finney, but more than that, against the growth of liberalism, German rationalism. This begins in Germany with Wellhausen, the theory of Pentateuchal sources, called JEDP. Genesis is originally four books that were fused together at later times in history. It comes from the original names of God in the Hebrew language, Yehovistic, Elohistic, uh, Deuteronomistic, and the priestly source, which they say came from Babylon. That's what liberal Protestantism teaches. Further people come along, later Bultmann, the German existentialist theologian, who said the resurrection was not literal, it was a principle. You have to make a difference between the Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history, the two different ones. The Jesus that rose from the dead is the Jesus of faith. It was an invention of the early church to engender belief. The Jesus of history we have to be concerned with, and we can't know much about him, and so on. So reacting against these things, there came a person called B.B. Warfield, Benjamin Warfield in America. And he was totally against the gifts of the Spirit. And he basically redefined Western evangelicism in these cessationist terms, these gifts all ended. Nonetheless, it fizzled out. It ended in Britain. In America, it continued. Finney's ministry was concentrated in New York and in New England, Massachusetts, that area of the Northeast United States. From there, Theo Moody comes. Theo Moody comes to Britain and preaches. And now, instead of Britain sending the missionaries and evangelists, America begins sending them back to Britain. Queen Victoria, in her old age, prays to receive Jesus with D.L. Moody. It was based on his influence upon her and what she saw in Scripture as a result that she supported initially the Bellflower Declaration to allow the Jews to return. When the Jews began returning to Israel for the first time in the 19th century, D.L. Moody goes to Jerusalem, stands across the street from Damascus Gate, up on the Arab Cemetery where Golgotha is, and preaches the gospel, causes a riot among the Muslims. That's Moody. So the, the Bible Belt of America shifts then from the Northeast to the Midwest. After him comes other people, like A.B. Simpson and Tozer. They found the Christian Missionary Alliance. And then a person comes, Harry Ironside, another one. These were men of God in their days. Billy Sunday was another one. Then it shifts to the south, people like Billy Graham. And the place to study then, or, or, in Finney's day, was Yale. But then Yale becomes liberal. So then the place to study was Moody Bible Institute in the Midwest, in Chicago. And then it becomes a place called the Dallas Theological Cemetery, Seminary, in Dallas. But then the Jesus movement happens in the 1960s and 70s. And the evangelical center of America becomes the West Coast, California. And everyone wants to go to Fuller Seminary. Like California is the new Bible Belt, as it were. Uh, it's like that. It continues in America. But even in America, evangelical Christianity is in decline. It's in decline because of the phenomena 
We'll look at in the last church. Laodicea. Laodicea. The lukewarm church. We'll talk about that the next time. But once again, let's look at Philadelphia. It was exactly what's happening now. A total cataclysmic change in the social economic fabric of society. People totally displaced. They can't make a living doing the things that they did, their father did, and their grandfather did. Urban decay, people crowded into the inner cities, crime going through the roof, infant mortality, social injustice, children being born out of wedlock and it being socially accepted, everything breaking down. People were saying, what is happening to our country? What is happening to Great Britain? What is happening to England? What is happening to Scotland? The crime, the breakdown of morals, the church means nothing, it's dead. Everything is dead. People don't respect the monarchy anymore. People don't respect the government anymore. People don't even respect the church anymore. Everybody's bankrupt. Everything's going down. you got these new people making all these tremendous fortunes while everyone else is going to the wall. What's happening? That's what was happening then, and that's exactly what's happening now. But God had a plan. He had a plan. His plan was to take people who really had a heart for him, educated people, middle-class people who had a heart for the poor, who cared about what was happening to their country and their society. They cared about it so much they were willing to put their lives on the line and turn their back on everything else except the gospel, except Jesus. That's what happened. God had to send foreigners here to bring the gospel. He sent them Arabians in those days. But then God began raising people up in Britain. He raised up the Methodists. And then he raised up other groups that followed the ideas of Philadelphia. It was a church that was the least Hellenistic of any church. It was the most closest to the original ideas of the Jewish church. In its philosophy, in its structure, with the brethren, even in its hermeneutics, even in the way it approached the Bible. It was much more Jewish. The Philadelphia movement, the way to interpret, look at these churches in ages, it came in Norwich, a person named Jane Lead. And people in her church, they began seeing how these seven churches were played out in history. Uh, that's what was happening. God was looking for people then who were willing to do this, to really emphasize holiness, and repentance, and self-sacrifice, and not only a love in word, but a love in deed. A love for the people in the inner cities, a love for the unemployed, a love for the, the children who were single parent families. He was looking for people who were willing to take their middle class affluence and their education and become servants of those people. That's the kind of people that God was looking for then, and he found them. That's the kind of people God is looking for now. My prayer tonight is that once again He's going to find them. God bless you and thank you. We hope you have enjoyed Grounded in the Word with Jacob Prash. We hope this teaching ministry is a blessing to you and a tool to equip you with the understanding of God's Word so you will not be deceived by today's false teachers. Please visit our website at moriel.org, M-O-R-I-E-L dot O-R-G, and sign up for the Moriel Ministries newsletter. Join us again next week for another helping of the meat of God's Word. Are you tired, discouraged, overworked, underpaid, or are you being paid nothing because your career evaporated before your eyes? Does something in your spirit portend judgment, a sense of doom? Do the headlines speak to you of strife, division, violence, and a sense that the world is falling apart? Do you just want to grab a bottle of liquid courage and sink into oblivion so you can escape life for a while? Do you yearn for hope? There are answers for all these things, and you might be sensing the holy hound of heaven reaching out to you.
find out who he is. Tim Roden and Chaplain Vince Tarkini scour the Word of God, looking for answers to these issues and help provide answers to the deepest longing of your soul. Don't be drunk with wine, but drink deep of the river of life on Afterglow with Tim Roden and Vince Tarkini every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on Rapture Ready Radio.